Hey guys, Casal here. You're about to watch Thorin talk and talk and talk. But it's kind of good, I swear. CSGO's open circuit, or at least the current application of it that we have right now in the game, has quite frankly, as you've probably seen in some of the news, what happened with the Astralis players, people like Kirby stepping back, many, many interviews, many comments said on social media, has led to massive burnout of players. Especially, actually, during the period when we had all the offline tournaments. We've certainly actually had a different type of burnout now with all these extended formats online, but you think of when everyone was travelling around the world to the big tournaments... The travel itself was brutal. You weren't traveling within region. You traveled the whole world over. You might go to South America, to North America, to Asia, to Europe, to wherever it could be, Australia, if you have an event there. There was, there was the sentiment that there wasn't enough time to actually scrim and put proper practice hours in between events when you're on the road for three or four of them. And as a result, rehaul your game, examine what you're doing down to the minutia, study the opponents in the same way as opposed to just a few demos the night before you play them the next day. There was a feeling that event scheduling was causing issues. Probably the most egregious was that one at the end of last year where ECS took place. The guys from um, Astralis won the tournament. Then they got on a plane with the people who they played in the final, Team Liquid. They flew over to Europe to play in the ESL Pro League finals. Spoiler, neither team made the final, neither team won that event. And they were basically playing like the very next day or something crazy like that. And you could see, these are this is untenable. You can't operate a sport that way. That's no way for people to, to do their job, quite frankly. Then, even without just the, how many events there were and how closely they were scheduled, there was the non-stop qualifiers. There was a million of those that you're playing in to even try and get into some of the events if you're not in, say, the top eight to ten teams that get invited to all the events. Then you've got to add in, as another factor, you're not just going to those events and traveling to those events then because each event organizer is different they want photographs of you that can update their for their broad production they want content interviews with you media did there were so many things that i get it that csgo pros feel like listen i'm already playing a stressful game where there's a massive premium on my performance being very high level tons of people who can replace me i'm expensive so i need to keep that level up and then on top of it i have all these extra things so when they look out over there i've heard this sentiment from a, a number of pros of the not tons but a number many times i've seen it expressed publicly in different manners essentially they look over at the lcs in america and lec in europe in league of legends and they think oh, that looks more appealing doesn't it you have like one central league that you play from so you're not travel all the time in fact essentially no travel you just live in the same city as that you've got time to scrim you've got all those days between the play days which you usually only say three a week or two a week you've got all that time to practice everyone's at home so you can all practice You've got structure to all of your play. You know, these are the group stage games, or in that case, the regular split. Then you know the playoffs is coming. Then you know there's a goal, whatever it might be. You kind of always know where you're at. It's not like, oh, well, will I be at this tournament next month? We didn't qualify for that yet. Not sure if we're getting an invite there. If we drop down, we're not going to get the invites. So we play extra qualify. You, you kind of have more of a sense of what your day is going to be like, right? So there's a perception that it'll lead to less burnout and that it just brings all these positives. You have good production. So this is all in the same studio, the same location. You get to know the people on the air. You don't have all these million tournament organizers doing things. So the sense is like, oh, this is better, right? This is just going to be worth Imagine if Valve did this. Imagine if there was one TO that ran the whole thing or Valve themselves invested and ran it. So... The most recent example of this was Bob Sketchy has done a few tweets along these lines. He deleted some of them, but he's done some way he sort of talked as though he wanted something like this instead of what we have now. And I, I've actually talked to him privately. I know essentially what some of his concerns are, and I'd be totally up for doing some sort of a show in the future where we could get those concerns out there from pros, and we can actually see if some of the current TOs we have, Flashpoint included, can address some of those and start to mitigate some of the problems. Because, spoiler, I think the open circuit is way better than what LCS and LEC offer. I think if you went and talked to top fans not top fans, fans in those games, I think they would tell you they want a lot of the things that we have in the open circuit and they look back fondly on season two when there was an open circuit in League of Legends and the cross-pollination of regions and travelling on this circuit and so many chances to show you great. So let's just start at the top because I'm going to burst this bubble for CS GoPros thinking that LCS and LEC are the way forwards. There's elements of what they do that I could see why you might want it brought in a CS, but there are so many negatives if you know the reality of it compared to the theory of it in your mind if you've never experienced it as a pro. So let's start with the format, right? So one of the ways they do it is it's more like a traditional f soccer sports league, right? You have this league, that's from here to here. Yes, they have a playoffs afterwards, but that first part, because it's getting you into the playoffs, is essential. It's basically the bread and butter of your career, your play. 
It's not like a random group stage and say this where, you know, you go out of that one out, whatever, there's another one. Every one of these games could count and be important towards your career, keeping your salary and getting access to the later at the playoffs, potentially the World Championship, where you're going to make your whole legacy. Without that, you're nobody. Quite frankly, I think league formats suck. I think they're terrible. Look at ESL Pro League. Look in the past when ECS was a league. Leagues are just garbage compared to tournaments. Like, Imagine for a second, if you played the ESL Pro League season, like many of you probably do, and then the finals, you make the playoffs, you have your playoff run, you win it, your second, top four, top eight, whatever it might be, and you do that twice a year, and then you have two majors as well, and then that's your whole year. Think about how much of the CS calendar I've just cut out. Think about how many tournaments I've eliminated. Think about how many great memories that you have that don't exist anymore. That's LCS and LEC. You have two splits. If you don't make the playoffs, tough shit. That's it. That's your whole year. It's just two, two double uh, round robins. That's it. That's all you get. You play the, the same teams four times in a year. And if you don't make playoffs, that's all you get for the whole year. Now, let's say you do make playoffs, you might get two playoff runs plus that. Now, one a year goes to MSI, if it's in League of Legends, to represent them. Depending on the region, three or four teams go to Worlds. Everyone else, that's it. You've just got your league play and a little bit of playoffs, and that's it for you. That's the whole year. Now, that might already sound... That sounds pretty appealing, actually. It's going to be less appealing when I start breaking down the reasons. So think about this. Imagine it's the summer split, right? You're, you guys are playing LEC, LCS and LEC now. Week one... Your team does really badly. Maybe it's a new lineup you've got. You've never played an official game because there only is the league. There's no small tournaments to warm up. There's no small tournaments to take someone and test a guy out. No, no. You have to have that team ready from week one. There are no excuses, no do-overs, and go in and play with that team. Now, if you do really badly in week one, let's say you start 0-2 off the super week, you start 0-3, 0-4, that now will inhibit what you later accomplish in week eight and week six and week five because it's just a league. It all goes... From the beginning to the end, my dude, it all counts. Every game counts. Think about what we've got now in the open CS Go circuit. If you go to your first LAN and you flop it completely, in the next week or two weeks or three weeks, you might have a different LAN. You go there, start at zero again, right? You don't have, you don't know carryover, no momentum from that event. You start at zero, and if you're good, you might become a good team. Remember when FaZe Clan made their lineup where they brought in Guardian Orph, my mega hyped uh, lineup, right? And then they had. The first tournament was Dream Up Masters Malmo. They flopped it. They finished in the group stage. But you know what? Right after that, a few weeks later, they went to ESL New York, smashed the whole event, won the LAN, Epic. E-League e Premier, smashed the whole event, won the LAN, Epic. Weren't even losing maps in the playoffs. That's what you remember, right? Well, imagine that story was FaZe Clan. They'd have had week one. That would have then made that those wins not as impressive. Since by the end, they'd leveled off from being the top, they never would have been ever number one. They would have been number one for like week two, three, four or something like that or top three for the first seven weeks or whatever. They would have never been a champion. They would have never been number one. They never had that glory because they didn't have as many chances to show themselves if they're in this format as they did in our game, in our circuit. Then how about this? Go the other way. Imagine the first three weeks you have, like FaZe Clan for most of that, a banging first three weeks you're winning most of your games you're beating all your rivals you're looking super sick but then you know what towards the end of the split the last three weeks let's say you cool off you hit a slump and you get to the playoffs but you're just averaging the playoffs everyone will now write off your entire split as what the end result was in the playoffs they don't give a fuck that you were the best in week three week four this happened in lcs actually it was when monty's team clg was like one of the best teams in the region in the middle of the split in season four summer, but because they just bombed out first round of the playoffs, no one gives a fuck. No one even remembers. Everyone talks that that team was terrible and he just coached a bad team. No one cares about it. Well, in CS, as I said, you might have won lands during that period. So they will be remembered. They're treated in isolation and they count towards your legacy. It's not how you did at the end of this season only. I mean, guys, imagine if, think of some of the players out there who are very good players, but have never won a major, never even made the final of a major, but they're champions elsewhere. They've done great things elsewhere. They're some of the greatest players elsewhere. They wouldn't have the same reputation. They wouldn't have the same accomplishments if they just had that Worlds and they never made it to a Worlds final. So their team was amazing, but because they have to go eight, nine weeks of consistency, they can never make a playoff run. They can never do what like Fury did when they broke out in 2019 or Gambit when they became good and they were flirting with everything. That would never happen. Or how about when Fallen's Luminosity first came up in 2015 where they would make it out of the group stage of each major and make it to the playoffs. Yeah, they didn't win, but they were proven they were better. If that was just a really long league format, first of all, there'd be no major for them. They wouldn't They wouldn't be in the top three te region, teams in a region perhaps. Then you've got to add in within their all league aspect, 
They, were, they weren't winning series. They would just be an average team. You'd have never even remembered the rise in the same way. They'd just be like, right, what were they, ninth in the world? Who gives a shit? No, no one would care. Then consider, aside from the fact, listen, as I've kind of alluded to there, I think tournaments are way better than, um, than leagues. I mean, consider this. Think of the NFL, ESL, um, not ESL, the European Premier League, if you want to have like a soccer example, for example. Right? There's many great players. I mean, one of my favorites of all time, Steven Gerrard, never won the EPL. Now, that makes him, for some people, not as great a player. But if that had been tournaments, well, I guess you already know that he won the Champions League. Champion, Listen, it might, it's better to show who the absolute best team is to have a league, for number one. For almost everyone else, I think it's actually worse for your career to not have tournaments. Because the second place and third place teams, you don't really remember them the same way. It's not the same as being a champion, right? In an open circuit like we have, you can still win tournaments. You can still be champions. Think about when Astralis won everything in 2018. Well, they didn't win everything, did they? Because who won ESL 1 Cologne? Na'Vi did. Third best team. That's way cooler than winning ESL 1 Cologne than just be third but, and never have a chance to beat Astralis in a league. I tell you right now. Then, how about this fact? There's way less prize money to be won in an LCS LEC type format. For many years, they would give the winner of the split, only two of them per year, remember guys, 40k to split between them. Now, yes, the big name players and top teams made more salary, but that was it. They just got it through their salary. And in fact, now I'd even argue if you're not in the best regions like LPL, China, etc., you probably make more overall, unless you're like a top 10 player in the West. If you are a top team, you make more in CS, winning tons of the prize money because of how competitive the TOs have to be in our game than you would just being a guy just making your salary and, and coming third or whatever in a European team. Because that's the thing. The open circuit benefits the winners more. You guys are the ones that they have. The TOs have to compete with you. You have to offer high prize money. Otherwise, you just don't go to their event, right? When there's one person controlling the scene, they can give you whatever prize money or lack thereof they fucking care about. Because they can say to your team, it's your job to pay them the salary. And at that point in time, instead, you might right now have an okay salary. Maybe you don't have the best salary in the world. But you can go to tournaments and win the prize money. You can prove with your skills, that should be my money. If you had to negotiate with your boss, maybe you can't do a good deal with your boss and you play a whole year trapped in just an okay salary with no way of changing the income that you're making, really. Yeah, that's kind of a, a whack scenario, right? Where does that money go in League of Legends, though? Where does what would be the extra prize money go? It either goes to inflated salaries. So now you're the guy who's a rival of yours, you think is mad overrated and never accomplishes anything. Well, he has a huge name. He's Hooney, so he just gets fucking all the prize money, uh, all the salary rather given to him. That's basically what happens. You take that prize money and you spread it to salaries. So now the worst players are making more. So if you're a champion... Some of what would have been your millions if you were an Astralis, oh, that's going to give the guy who's in the 10th place team a better salary, giving him a better overall inflated level of income just because he plays in the league. Like, I don't know about you guys. I'm not going to go into a whole capitalism, socialism, like economic model thing, but I'd rather be in the world where my skills win me the prize money. And then at the end of it all, I don't have to give a fuck what anyone's opinion was, what anyone thought, what my manager ended up paying me, what my agent told. I can just make the money back based on my skills and how great I am at the game. I think that's fabulous for people who are very competitive, who are great players. Then add in, there's less space for roster moves because people are locked in. And by the way, you can't poach in LCS and LEC. Like you have to go and literally ask permission of the team to even speak to the guy, to even know if he'd be interested in joining your team. Now listen, everyone obviously secretly on the side would ask him. But if you ever get caught by that, like anyone outs you, someone spiteful that you didn't pick them up or a deal didn't happen, you get fined and maybe even games banned. You could get all sorts of punishments. CS could not run the way it runs right now. And you could not find young talent in the same way. Imagine if when FaZe had brought in Bymas, they just had to keep him for a whole split a whole year maybe and they couldn't change him out like it's either going to be a way higher cost there's going to be so many more problems there way more stress on him he can't even just come in have that brief period then go to a small team like it's not the same mobility either for players and teams in this situation so not only will you not be making those moves and having as many chances to fix your team but you won't be making those moves. In those games, those franchise leagues, the players don't have the power to make to bring in who they want. The coaches and the top people do that. In CS, it's largely by nature of the scene we have and the power that players have with this incredible mobility. It's actually the players who have a lot of the freedom right now. And they're the ones who own the major slot. That won't happen in a franchise league if Valve gets involved. Like It'll be your team that owns the world slot. And if you want to leave your team after six months, you won't be going to Worlds Magic. You'll be going to join someone else. Else's team and taking 
on their results. Imagine that kind of a scenario where, again, you don't have the same ability to walk or say, I want out or force your way out. You just stay stuck on a team right now. Stewie 2K would have just been locked into Cloud9 for 2018. He wouldn't have been going to MIBR for that big salary. All sorts of different moves. Obviously, Astralis themselves would have just kept Kirby most likely, in which case... There would be no Omegas. There would be no Australis 2018-2019, the greatest team of all time. Then how about this? Because you have this league format, you have this one set structure, now you play an entire split, you get to the playoffs. Oh, I can't wait for this. We've been doing well. Our team's coming on leaps and bounds. What you find out in your first playoff series, one of your teammates is a bit of a choke or just can't handle the pressure. He fucks it up. He loses the whole series for you. Yeah, that's you done. You don't qualify to Worlds. Or that's your first split of the year done. You've got one more crack at it. Do you replace him and gamble that he's going to learn the shit and get it together? Do you stick with him saying, oh, I think you can do it. Can you even get anyone else between it? There's a million problems here. Again, this is an example where what looks good in the big picture, you start pulling at some of the threads, that tapestry disappears, my dude. There's nothing there. It's, it's, just, it's just nothing hanging in the wind, right? So how about this? Burnout is bigger in League of Legends. You're going to think, that can't be. You just said you play less games, it's spread out. This is why. Because with events and the ups and downs, you actually get less burned out if you have a failed event. Because you just go out on day one or day two, you have a couple of days to recuperate, you go back, you maybe get a couple of scrim days in, you travel the next event. Or if you're a lesser team, you don't have an event there for two weeks, you play some online qualifiers, you get to the next event. Now imagine in that scenario where you can basically fail in sort of a controlled manner and get many more chances... Now imagine the stress of being on a team that starts a split two to six after the first three or four weeks. That's enormous. That's always going to be hanging behind you. That baggage comes with you, the results. And you now have to battle against that with your next results. So now the pressure on you is not only enormous, it's growing week to week to week to week. So you're playing and practicing nonstop to try and overcome the momentum of what those results mean for you and your potential future within that year and that team. So... You might not even drastically improve since, you know what, you're playing just to win games each week. It's life and death every week. You want to play when you're practicing catch to be the best team you can be, then go to the tournament, see how much of that works and keep practicing so that one day you can be the number one team, right? No, no, no. In these games, you practice life or death. Whoever you play in that week, that those are the only games that matter. And it's about getting a 2-0 if you play two games that week. Whether that means you do something gimmicky, you just practice some of the same things again, you just study the opponent a little bit. You, you aren't practicing in the same holistic manner in that kind of a sense. Also, think about this. When do you ever get a break? If you're on top, right, well, now you have to practice tons to stay there, right? Everyone's coming for you. If you're just below the top, you're a team that can gun for the number one. You've got to keep practicing. We've got to practice more than them to become number one. If you're a team that's just like fourth, fourth fifth, sixth, you're in playoff position. Got to keep practicing now, guys. You can't drop out of playoff position. Now you're the teams who aren't there. Well, now you're not on top. Now you better get there. Now your career's in jeopardy. And the results of this split is going to be everything for whether or not your manager or your owner keeps you on that team. You don't have a couple of little tournaments to show off some potential or make him believe long-term or say, no, well, don't worry, we'll get it together. Think about most sports team that took like nine, eight months to come online. That would have been their whole year busted. There would be no worlds for them. They never could have won the equivalent of ESL Pro League Season 10. So if you are the top team, by the way, Good news is you get even more wrecked. Yeah, true. Astralis got wrecked by having all those top fours at the end of the year and a million events. It's the same for these guys. You play the spring split, you win it. You go to MSI, the mid-season invitational, kind of like a mini major. You go in the summer split, coming in as number one, all that pressure. You win the summer split, you go to Worlds, you play all of Worlds. After that, if you're a superstar, you might even have the all-star game. You get called up. By the way, you can't decline that in theory. Like you're supposed to go and play it. Like it's supposed to be a big deal for Riot, the people who are game developers and have all the IP rights. You can't say no in the same way you do to TOs, guys. These guys basically decide if you have a career as a pro. Now, think about this. In CS, we have two player breaks for you now. We have the one at Christmas and we have the one that was around August. You get one break in League of Legends. It's the off-season. And by the way, that off-season, are you are you in the Maldives sipping on con No. The first few weeks of the off-season is a nightmare of trying to make sure that you either are staying on this team or who's going to be on your team or am I going to another one? Am I talking to suitors? Because you can only talk to you during the off-season in theory unless the team's given permission. And so in this setting... It never stops, guys. In League of Legends, it never stops. The stress, the burnout, it's 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 just spread out in a different way. And so you're getting you're getting tricked into saying, well, it's not in this area I'm used to seeing it in. And you're not noticing it's hidden away in a million little alcoves elsewhere. Then how about the idea of the dev being heavily involved anyway? 
They will then, if you've seen what people like Riot Games and Blizzard are like, you don't want Big Daddy to come in with the belt and start fucking smacking people. It ain't going to be fun. They're going to be handing out bans, fines, punishments for behavior in matchmaking and face it games, by the way. They're going to police basic jokes you make, whatever speech you have, simple behaviors where they think you're too rude, disrespectful, all sorts of shit that you get away with now in this game because Valve doesn't really generally notice it. I'm thinking of some of the players. Simple with that cheating ban, KNG saying he'd kill someone and making quite ridiculous comments online for racial invective like these things will get you in so much trouble you could argue maybe they should anyway but i don't want the game dev enforcement i want like your employer to do that like your t or one to that you did it in to potentially do something like that if you let the game dev come in with their heavy-handed approach and especially riots where they're trying to like fuck your mind to be the kind of person that they want that isn't going to be fun for you guys that live in a banter-filled game like we have in CS. Well, you get to have your personality shut off. Even market yourself that way. So I always give this analogy to explain why I like essentially not what Valve does, but what they don't do and why that makes them better than Riot and Blizzard. So here's the analogy. Because I'm not going to say Riot that Valve's great, by the way, but listen to the analogy. So think about it when you're a kid, right? Riot and Blizzard are the super strict, overbearing parents who want to, like, micromanage every hour of your day. They want to tell you what to do, how to talk, how to behave. They have expectations of what you're going to become as a person, what sort of job you'll go into, how you'll conduct yourself. And you feel like, oh, God, I'm smothered here. This is a nightmare. It's like being in boot camp in a military or something. Now, here's what Valve is. They're not the awesome, lovely parent. No, no, no. Valve's just the absent parent. They're just at work and they just give you the key and let you just come in and do what you want. And then you just see him for a couple of hours later, the equivalent of the major, right? We get to do what we want in a game where Valve does things the way they do right now. And even though in general, I could go for a compromise. Like we have a whole circuit of 10 lands and they sort of decide who does them. The problem is they tried that in Dota and because Valve is Valve, they didn't do it in the right way. They fucked up a lot of details of it. And some of the people in Dota aren't that happy with that. So right now there isn't an ideal setting. And I get it that the grass sometimes seems greener on the other side but that could also be an optical illusion guys this video was kindly supported by dean tanglis spencer green water things pernogo matt Shikowski, tobias bernasconi j dubs alexander rao zinged the Puyallup tribe, Jensen Gore, Hades, Andreas Crockneys, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my boy Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Maybe you want to ask me a question in one of those video AMAs I do. Do you want teasers? Do you want to see who the next guests are on my shows? Do you want to take part in an in-depth esports discussion with moi? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today in the Patreon link in the description box below.